Okay, so right now we're in the loaders position um, inside the tank. Uh, interesting point to note, um, specific to T55, uh, this tank has the, the, the modernized upgrade, one of them being nuclear capable. So this tank was designed to withstand a nuclear blast. And a few of those features mean um, this, uh, this particular surface here that you see, it's a layer of uh, padding. I'm not quite sure exactly what's in it, but uh, it's, it's like a high density foam type of uh, ceramic plating here, which is, uh, I'm given to understand, uh, provides a certain degree of protection against radiation. And um, all the hatches on this tank, including the turret bearing race, is designed to completely seal itself off from a nuclear blast. Um, those of you who may be veterans of, of using these tanks, you would know a lot more than I would about uh, the nuclear capabilities, but if someone feels the need to comment on, on how it works, that would, that would be great. Okay, so as the loader, basically uh, my task here would be loading rounds into the gun. Um, this gun is uh, what we might call a, a semi-automatic, I guess you could say, in terms of... Uh, it's auto ejecting and it resets itself automatically based off the recoil. So uh, if you want to bring the camera around here, this gun does not have a block inside of it. But once I load the round in, these are called extractors. I don't know if you can see them or not. Okay, so there's one on the top, one on the bottom. So once the base of the round trips these extractors and seats itself inside the barrel, the block essentially slides closed. Now inside the block is your firing pin that actually hits the primer of the round. Once the gun fires, everything is mechanically rides on cams. When the gun goes into recoil, the block slides out to the side again, and these extractors, which are spring-loaded, actually force the round back out, and it has what we call an auto ejector. So the round automatically ejects itself out. The whole entire gun recocks everything back to the firing position. From that point, all I need to do is throw another round in there, re-trip the extractors, and we can just keep going. Uh, moving around to the top of the gun, up here we have what's called our recoil brake and our replenisher. Now what these do, they're basically giant shock absorbers. Uh, one of these, uh, when the gun violently recoils, one of these is a fluid-filled cylinder designed to absorb the recoil of the gun and slow the recoil of the gun down to a to a, a speed that is not um, too harsh on the tank and the system. The other one during recoil creates a suction and what happens is when the gun reaches full recoil, this one is providing um, um, a power that draws the gun back into its uh, original firing position. Moving around to the side right over here, uh, we have, uh, this is our PKT mount. So the PKT would sit right in here. Uh, tray, feed tray for our ammunition and our catch bag for our link and, and spent rounds. Down here at the front, we have uh, some of our round holders. So these would hold uh, rounds. These also double as our fuel holding cell. So there is actually fuel that sits inside the, the round holders there. There's also a nose tank forward of that. <clears throat> and then various uh, gunner controls and, and periscopes up here, looking through the view that you might see. I don't know if that's gonna. Okay, so one of the, what might be considered a disadvantage to uh, the Russian vehicles is uh, unlike um, Western tanks that have the much larger turret, a lot of the, the uh, ability to store rounds is inside the turret. With these uh, series of tanks, the majority of your rounds are inside the hull. So as we just looked, they're down in front of the loader. There's also a few other positions down in the hull. The issue is when the turret is traversed uh, as the loader, I can't reach uh, the ammunition I need um, potentially. Obviously you have all your different kinds of ammunition. So that's why at the back of the turret here, we have what's called a ready round rack. So when the gunner has a spare moment or spare time, he's able to pull uh, the rounds that uh, are most likely to be used. He's able to pull those rounds out of the lowest storage in the turret and have them here in his ready round rack. Um, I think in the turret, yeah, the turret, that's really all there is at the back here. And with the T62, a bit larger turret, you have a few extra spaces for your ready rounds. But uh, for the most part, all your rounds are down underneath. Um, and, and again, that creates issues. For example, if um, 
if I have all my heat rounds stored in, in one section of the lower half and we're traversed in the opposite direction, uh, the gunner needs a secondary heat round and I have no heat rounds in my ready round bin, we have to traverse off target so that I can get to that ready round. Um, I would assume that in these tanks, the loader or the crew would have their own SOPs, a standard operating procedure as to how they handle that type of situation. Uh, but again, those of you that have uh, served inside these tanks, if you want to uh, comment on, on how you were able to overcome the challenges of um, getting the rounds you needed from the lower half of the tank, that would be great. Okay, so here on the top of the turret, the crew commander's cupola, as I mentioned before, uh, the loader and the crew commander's uh, turrets free spin. If I just pull this lock right here, that's my um, travel lock, I can now traverse in either direction. Uh, complete 180 so that's it that's a cool feature about this i'll just put the lock back in and that's it okay, so here we are right now we're inside the crew commander's hull um pretty straightforward up here uh i would be sat up and i would have the gunner immediately right at my feet here so as you can see there's really not a lot of space uh gunner's control is all in front of me but uh we'll go through that part in a moment but coming back up to here this is uh this is the early type of periscope, it's basically just a vision block. And then once I close the hatch, I'll be surrounded by vision blocks. I can pull the traverse lock on my turret and literally spin around and check uh, every direction, new targets, and then reference to the gunner where they're at. And then right next to me here, I have the radio set up. Uh, this one's in Polish, so. Uh, we won't be getting our radio functioning, but um, this is basically the radio controls as far as I'm aware and a few other units he has here and that's that's basically it really. We are in the gunner's um, seat. So before we get started on the components, uh, the, the, the Polish T-55, uh, most of the variants were commonly known as T-55 Merida. Uh, from what I understand, Merida is the Polish specific upgrade that they did to the fire and weapon system. So uh, these units uh, here, the optics unit and the controls is, is unique to uh, Poland. <coughs> so um, if you were to jump in a Soviet uh, Russian variant, you would see a different uh, configuration up here. So moving down to controls. <coughs> so you have, uh, you basically have two methods of traverse. You have uh, manual and then um, electronic. Um, so basically, uh, the this T55. One feature I l uh, like about the Russian tanks is the traverse motor for the turret is actually electronic, which is mounted right here. So it's just an electric motor that runs up through a reduction gear and then it transfers power down into the bearing race and the turret gear right there. Um, this is what's called an azimuth indicator, and uh, as we traverse. Um, we're in turret lock right now, but as we traverse, this spins and we're down here as the gunner, we're down here in the dark and even sometimes through our visuals, we can't see where the hull is. So this helps us to know where uh, the gun is pointed in orientation to 12 o'clock off the hull. Also too, the crew commander can shout to the gunner at any time at target indication. And here we we'll use the degrees or mill system right here in the gun. This will help the gunner get onto, onto direction. Um, obviously this here, this actually symbolizes 12 o'clock on the tank, you know, the sides of the tank and the track. So zero up here would be 12 o'clock on the hull. Um, so that's the azimuth indicator, electronic traverse motor. So gunner's controls we have right here. Um, unlike some tanks where there's a master switch, uh, the, the power, power to this turret is always on. Uh, so the, the gunner would just have to open the switch to uh, provide controls through the unit here. So here we go power on and then he just has traverse light, traverse left, up and down. All these other switches and functions do it, uh, numerous things like providing uh, an illuminated reticle. Um, and then he has, uh, I believe, uh, the electronic trigger on one side is main gun. The trigger on the other side is the coaxial machine gun. Uh, moving on from that, uh, you won't be able to see it, but um, grab that off here. So down under here, this uh, it's on the side of the gun. This is actually the trigger mechanism. 
Uh, so up underneath here is a solenoid and when the gunner he fires off his round an electric solenoid uh, trips the sear which releases the firing pin mechanically but if you have an electronic failure or a system short this here is the manual firing pin so you can engage that solenoid the same solenoid manually by slamming on that one right there um, up here you have uh, if you have an issue with your extractors uh, back in the barrel there not pulling the round out uh, you can manually start reefing on this and engage the, instruct the extractors and give them some assistance to pull that round out. And if you have a misfire, this, uh, this lever here, you can manually recock the gun with this one here. Uh, this uh, system right here, it's a, uh, a tiny little bubble level, but the gunner can actually set to when he wants the gun laid on level. Or well, the crew commander can give him a bearing and direction and he can uh, he'll basically just wind this degree to the crew commander's direction and then level off the bubble to get his correct elevation um, other than that you have you have a manual um, elevation as well and then he also switches that to electronic and then again up here this is your um, this is your gunner's telescope so your long range find zero up here is just your standard uh, day viewing site and then here would be the, uh, the, the more advanced optics like your night vision and thermal. Okay, uh, I'm, I really like this unit here. This is a very um, old way of, uh, it's a reliable mechanical way of uh, heating the engine up prior to a start and being in northern Europe, the very cold climates that these tanks are expected to um, start up in, is it's a big ask for a diesel. So um, basically most of you that drive a diesel would be familiar with what we call a glow plug. Uh, they're basically just a plug inside the cylinder. Uh, you turn a key, that plug provides uh, uh, power and, and it just glows a little element inside the cylinder, heating the cylinder. But um, in areas where these tanks operate, where it gets extremely cold, that glow plug is, it's not necessarily enough to preheat an engine. So this is what this unit does. It serves as a multifunction here. So basically you have, uh, you have this heating cylinder on the bottom. And the way that this works is this is a pump right here. This pumps fuel and uh, coolant. That uh, fuel pumps through the end of the unit down here and the fuel is sprayed over a, uh, an ignition plug and it actually ignites a candle and turns this into a giant heater. Then at the same time, the, uh, as the fuel is pumping in, fueling the burner, coolant uh, goes into this cylinder and moves through this cylinder and the burner actually preheats coolant and fuel. And uh, this electronic motor here is uh, runs straight off the battery, so when we want to go into a preheat, in some of those uh, real freezing areas, the manual says sometimes you have to run the heater for 15 to 20 minutes just to heat the engine up enough. So where your glow plug is purely heating just the cylinders themselves and heating the air going into the engine, this unit heats uh, the coolant in the whole entire system and basically warms the radiator, all the cooling galleys, uh, uh, the whole engine basically gets heated up using this burner unit. We turn on this electro electronic pump here, which uh, gets power from the battery, and then the battery just has to power the ignition plug, and it's belt driven, so this pump runs manually and just uh, belt drives. Uh, the good thing about uh, the Russian uh, Soviet systems, I think, is everything has a manual backup in case of a failure. So even if this electronic motor fails during your preheat, you can just get power to your plug down there, you can disengage this and actually manually hand crank and manually pump uh, heated coolant through the system in case you lose a belt or your engine or your, your electronic motor doesn't work anymore. So when they went into T62, they made this unit slightly smaller. This one's more unique to, uh, to uh, T55, but um, that's basically it. That is an old school engine preheat. There is also, um, because there's a giant diesel flame burning in here, there is actually an exhaust port that shoots out the bottom of the tank right here. So uh, you can adjust it, but if you have um, 
not quite an accurate adjustment. You can actually see diesel flame shooting up the exhaust port underneath the tank. So uh, that's one of the units we won't be using here in Las Vegas without heat, but it is uh, it's a unique feature of these tanks, a really cool way of preheating. Okay, so here we are in the driver's compartment. As you can see, it is very cramped. Uh, a unique feature of T62 is uh, the hull is actually a foot wider. So uh, later down the road, when we get into a T62, you'll see we have much more space. So I'm gonna quickly show you how we open up the driver's hatch. Uh, it's basically a spring-driven unit, and it actually has a sensor up here, a stop sensor, so that the turret cannot be traversed electronically if the driver's hatch is open. So that's what that does right there. So it basically pulls down. There it goes, okay. Spring loaded up. Okay. Okay, so moving from front to back around the tank, right next to the camera right here, these are the air storage bottles for the air start system. Then we have our gauge reader right here and our on and off levers. So uh, again, one feature of the Russian tanks I like is we have, uh, we have two methods of starting the tank. And in those freezing cold climates when you're gonna be cranking for potentially quite some time to get the thing started, uh, before you uh, basically before you basically go draining your battery and running that starter motor and sucking your batteries dry, you have enough air pressure built up in here from the last time you ran to be able to crank the engine maybe four or five times. Uh, so we run off KPA, uh, uh, sorry, a kilogram squared, and I believe it holds about 150 kilograms squared uh, when it's fully charged. So the driver would come in here, open his bottles, make sure his gauge is full, and then these just pre-charge that air start cylinder we showed you earlier. And uh, again, in freezing cold temperature, the, this has a tremendous amount of air pressure stored in it. Unfortunately, right behind the driver's head, but um, uh, you have a much higher torque through this high charge air than you would the battery draining that starter motor. Uh, so again, moving forward, uh, this unit here is an electric solenoid, so up on the dash, uh, when I actually want the air system to engage, it electronically disengages this solenoid that allows the air to pass through it and rush out to the engine. Uh, these units here is all your linkage controls for the steering, which can be adjusted. Moving, moving uh, further forward, uh, this unit here is a, a, a lever which basically uh, in the back of the tank on the engine bay you have uh, airflow flaps and you can control whether these are open or closed depending on hot weather, cold weather or if you're going to go into a fully submerged uh, system you would have this closed. Moving further around we have our speedometer right here. Uh, this one's in kilometers per hour. Further forward of that it's a little hard to see but these tanks actually have hand throttles. So again, it's all mechanical. Uh, when you uh, manipulate this louver here, it just excites the accelerator pedal and it locks into a certain position. Okay, again, uh, driver's uh, periscopes, we're driving closed down right here. Okay, just like any manual car, you have clutch on the left, brake in the middle, accelerator on the right. And then we talked about steering lever positions before. So right now we're in zero. You would pull back and engage one and then pull back again and engage position two. Uh, gear select right here. It's a uh, five speed plus reverse. Um, this tap here, uh, basically the driver can choose um, which, which fuel cells he wants to draw fuel out of being external, internal. Right next to it here, we have a fuel priming pump. So what this does is it allows the driver to, if the tank is stuck for quite some time, it allows the driver to bring fuel and push all the air out of the lines that has built up in the lines and prime the tank. Uh, at one point, this tank had a, a compass, so the crew commander could give the driver a direction and bearing, and he would have an illuminated compass that he could follow off on. Moving around here onto the dash, 
we have uh, various controls here. Um, moving over to this one here, far right. Uh, one of the unique features of, of the T62 is you can uh, manually prime oil and bring uh, the oil in the tank up to pressure, which uh, must be done before startup. And then you have uh, various gauges here that, you know, oil pressure, oil temperature, uh, coolant temperature, amperage, revs. And then if your air start system uh, fails and does not work, you have a manual uh, where you go to the electronic starter motor and start the tank that way. Um, but basically that is the driver's controls. That is it. Excellent. All right, thank you, Scott. Yeah, you're welcome. Hope you enjoy any questions or comments, uh, let us know and we'll, uh, we'll do our best to answer them. And uh, one day soon we'll move into T62 and we'll do a side-by-side -side comparison video of T55 and T62. So thank you.